uh, nations uh, in Africa, south of the Sahara, and South Asia, and Southeast Asia, and Latin America. He's been a consultant to the UN at large, the UN development programs, the UN uh, Capital Development Fund, to the World Health Organization, Habitat, and the Bank of African Development. And 1989-90, um, he was a Fulbright Senior Scholar at the University of Nairobi in Kenya's School of Architecture and Development. And this evening, he's going to talk about architecture in eight and a half projects, which is a presentation about his latest work uh, with the UN and with some particular description of the work he did while he was on his Fulbright. And I had occasion to see some of this material before, and it's really very excellent work. And it's a pleasure to um, introduce Alfredo Messer. We're very proud of his efforts, as we always are. Is everyone listening correctly? Yes. <laughs> or hearing correctly? Uh, I want first to thank you very much to, for coming tonight. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you, like the extended family in Africa, uh, around me tonight. And uh, as Marvin said, uh, I think that this is an opportunity for me to share with you some of the experiences I had uh, in uh, the third world. Uh, I thought I owed you this uh, talk or chat uh, since I came back from the Fulbright Scholar Award that was like two years ago. And for uh, circumstances totally not under my control, uh, that didn't happen until today. Therefore, for me, they are kind of old news. And uh, many things happened since I went to Nairobi, as many things happened before going to Nairobi. And uh, nothing happens in life uh, without any reason. And therefore, what I'm, the projects that I was involved with that I'm going to show tonight, in reality, were projects that occur just before, during, and after the Fulbright Scholar Award. My relationship with nations of the third world and mainly with Africa, which is my second home continent, I would say, uh, didn't occur in one day. It's not the Fulbright that put me there. I had a long series of projects that started in 1978, even before knowing uh, Mansi. In reality, I came the first time to Mansi living in Africa. I was at that time living with my wife and my son, which are here present in Abidjan, Ivory Coast. And that was my linkage to Mansi, was coming from Abidjan. It was not coming from necessarily Buenos Aires. We traveled and flew from Abidjan to Chicago and uh, got very sick. It was very cold in Chicago. And uh, you have a big reaction when you do that. Anyhow, um, to start somewhat giving you a background platform for you to understand what are the reasons that I do what I do and the title I put to this lecture, I, I, I owe you some explanation. And uh, one I'm going to, to, of course, I believe that uh, being uh, many of you I know of moviegoers, this is title which is using two titles of two movies. Uh, one is, of course, I do architecture, but I travel because I am an architect and I'm hired to do a lot of traveling, not in touristic places, but in nice places that are important for me. And uh, in eight and a half projects, that's based on Federico Fellini, uh, best movie, because I never know exactly how many projects I have done. I don't even know really if what I do are projects. I don't know even if it is architecture. And to, t to tell you the truth, I'm not necessarily uh, very obsessed about it being or not being architecture. I know that I usually do things that range from the very minute, very small, very little hut or primitive construction to regional planning or urban strengthening uh, projects. Therefore, bear with me. It's not very long. But there is a statement which I want to pronounce before the, the initiation of the slideshow. And then it will be like uh, a series of blocks which will illustrate each one of the projects since 1989. Uh, the Western world initiated in the Third World during colonial times a development process based in substitution and dependency. It introduced technologies that needed the colonial powers to run the newly acquired territories. Local people, local resources, and culture were at best considered 
primitive. A similar paternalistic dependency guided the best intentions of Western religious group. This pattern lasted until the late 50s, early 60s. After political independence, the new nations had to confront a new type of colonialism based on fast profits for the West and little benefits for the Third World. Example of this approach are the famous white elephants, and I was part of one of those white elephant projects, uh, or turnkey projects, uh, like the gigantic hospitals using complex technologies and important materials and require unavailable huge annual budgets to cover staff, maintenance, and recurrent costs. Facilities with no physicians or nurses to run them were built where no sewage existed. Toilets for Muslim people were designed facing Mecca with no knowledge or respect for the local cultures and beliefs. Concrete blocks were used as standard building materials in Africa, south of the Sahara, where only one cement factory existed. Russian included snowplows in turnkey factories built in equatorial Africa. The United States exported non-metric buildings materials. Therefore, when you lose the key of your office, you had to buy a new door. There is no fit between the holes in a door in metric and non-metric system. Therefore, there is no way to replace a lost key, which of course doesn't match the hole. Therefore, it's very common to find in Africa cut into pieces doors which are patched, and therefore you, you, you get a, a new door, let's say. Europe was transferring its high-tech construction standards to favor export of European-made construction components. To obtain the driver's license in Francophone Africa, you had to learn the chapter techniques for driving in snow-covered roads. And uh, people were asking me, what is snow? How it feels, okay? Uh, but nonetheless, the exam included those topics. One of the most damaging issues for developing countries has been the approach to major public housing schemes. These were built using foreign standards and materials, disregarding local needs, local resources, cultural and social patterns, climatic conditions, economic and financial possibilities. The paradox of this approach is that a major measure of economic health and growth of a nation is usually assessed in terms of growth and productivity of its housing industry. We know that very well in today's United States in which one of the indicators of our prosperity, uh, which is not always working very well, is the one of the housing industry. To substitute locally produced dwellings by imported ones or using foreign currency to build them has been one of the reasons for the current state of affairs in the developing world. Urban plans and architectural projects in these countries, like in any other country in the world, must target the growth and development of their communities providing for the utilization of their resources with the employment of their people, generating stable sources of income and socioeconomic progress. Along with the consolidation of democratic processes in the third world, there is today the conscious understanding that the substitutive transfers of technology and dependency-based help our international policies of the past. If any government or interest group in the world is still today believing in that way, it is because they have the temptation of unlawful benefits, better known in the field as budget line item, special public relation costs. They amount sometimes to 7% to 10% of the total budget. The rationale of international organizations like the UN for the formulation of projects for development is focused today in the utilization of local resources and manpower to attain replicability and sustainability with direct measurable impact for socio-economic development of the communities concerned. South-to-South -south collaboration and training, accessibility to employment, education and personal credit, community participation and development, maintenance costs, economic and financial replicability, and sustainability are some of the approaches for successful project completion. Okay, this description gives you more or less the background and the philosophy in which usually I operate, and it's the one that uh, I today prevails in the third world, in the developing world, in terms of uh, my profession. What you're going to see now is not necessarily very glamorous architecture or very shiny front cover um, architectural magazine shots, but they are the real world of the third world and uh, the realities that people have to deal with and that I believe we cannot ignore, or at least I don't want to ignore. Uh, you will see two alferos uh, in front of you. Uh, one can do 
competitions of architecture and be involved in DECON, uh, Peter Eisenman, and discussions about uh, postmodern or whatever other type of architecture we have in this moment as the shining path, I would say. But uh, in the other hand, I'm also, I believe, a person which is responsible to his environment and his society. And as part of the world and having been exposed to the world, I owe it to at least be able to operate in this type of background, which I'm giving you now. Uh, if you forgive me, those who had had already some information about what I do, I'm going to present a little, very small bullets of previous projects. It's kind of interesting. I started doing formulation. In, in the UN jargon, the, the uh, type of work which consultant people do starts with the identification of projects in the field. Another approach which follow that one is the formulation of a project, which if project is as not to be confounded with an architectural project. It is something that starts before a building is built and dies or ends after the building is built. Uh, a project is something which has to benefit and is rooted in a community. And if a building has to be built as an objective of a path to obtain community development or to benefit someone, it's to be recommended. If not, it may not be recommended that it would be ever built. Then, from formulation, you go to um, supervision, from supervision, which of course is implementation or part of implementation, you go to evaluation. And today there is a lot of evaluations going on. People want to learn the lessons and therefore at the, my early projects they were ma mainly in the area of formulation. My later projects are more in the area of evaluation. Once you have proven that you are able to formulate projects, usually they call you to evaluate what others do during implementation or when they are already implemented. Okay, uh, can we have the slides, please, or I just point them with this? Okay. Uh, these two graphics, one in the left is the one that shows where chronologically I have done work, and it's kind of curious because I start to move from uh, Latin America were in point A and then crossing across the Atlantic going to, to West Africa and from West Africa I start to have projects eastward until I hit Bangladesh and then from Bangladesh uh, I cross to Southeast Asia and back to Africa. It has been totally unintentional from my part how I had done that kind of eastward movement with my projects but it happened in that way. Uh, the drawing you see on the right is very much, I think, illustrating into a synthetic drawing what I had tell, told you earlier in my reading. The basic approach I usually do is, of course, being well informed as much as I can of the traditions, the history, the potentials, the geography, and the network which usually is the background information which is needed for any project. And uh, of course, Africa is a little known continent, but it has a history of its own, which in reality has provided much of the advances uh, since the Middle Ages of Western civilization crossing the Sahara towards the north and then from the north to Europe. But that's a little known fact. And that they were very important kingdoms and, uh, and, and very powerful rulers in Africa, it's a fact as they were very sophisticated universities in places like Timbuktu and Gao. One of the lessons I've learned too is that no matter how humble or how quote-unquote primitive my client is, this is my client. And here we were so lucky to be able to visit and be accepted by a group of pygmies in the Central African Republic. My wife and my son were there, that was some time ago in 1986. But these are the people who are respected in Africa, the elders, the ones who transmit knowledge and tradition. I also have to look to the, f the generations of the future, the ones who are going to inherit the world that we built for them and uh, which in somehow will be what we let them to be, not what they have to support from our mistakes. 
I also usually have to do very extensive field work. Every one of the projects, every one of the places I visit entails very exhaustive field work. In this case, it's kind of curious, you would notice a kind of uh, unroofed structure and uh, it shows a phased construction uh, approach in Africa. This is in the Gambia, which by the way you're going to see, the Gambia is where Kunta Kinte, the hero of roots, Alex Haley, uh, which died a while ago, uh, original place and you see people in Africa usually build first the walls then they can use the structure of the mud walls as a structure to support the roof which is there being built as an inverted cone using the cylinder of the walls as support and then the roof is turned flip over and capping that room. Before there is a very sophisticated knowledge, very simple but thorough technique of construction. This one is one of my favorite, favorite places in the world. This is a very old project, which I usually show, and it's, uh, I had to do this for the World Health Organization along the Niger River, and it was for proposing a system for primary health care in 1984, one of my, the first uh, real major projects I had to work with in a region of five million inhabitants, which was mainly composed of nomadic people. Uh, it was very interesting for me because at that time it was the, the, the origin of the primary health care which is based on preventive care, not in curative, curative care. And more or less here you have an, a very simplified, condensed version of the solution proposed. I'm not going to explain it, it's just for you to more or less have a background idea of what I have done previous the projects I'm going to present. Uh, these are details of constructing constructive techniques from Burundi in uh, Burundi is a very interesting place because it's where the two major rivers, the Nile and the Congo River, get origin or are originated in Africa. And you can see that the sophistication of the natural, the utilization of natural resources uh, gets to the form of an art. The way the knots are done is not any way, it's a very specific way with very specific rules. Uh, following that, some introduction of very simple very third world technologies, but nonetheless effective ones, in which mud bricks, compressed bricks, are being molded and then fired. And they use that as a strategy to force politicians to give them healthcare, schools, and other community facilities by producing the materials, putting them on the site, giving the site, and saying, now you have everything you need, please build me a school or build me a dispensary, provide me with the system, the support system I need. And uh, this is in Burundi. And this is, again, the project that was there formulating for that country. And uh, this is a very little known project. I think I never really showed it here, either to the students or the faculty. This is a community hospital designed uh, for Burundi, uh, for uh, the Central African Republic, I'm sorry, Bangui, which is the country of the Emperor Bokassa, a very, very particular place on Earth. And uh, we spent there like four months having to put together a, a, a 350 bed hospital with uh, this person there, which is an Argentinian biomedical engineer. Uh, Liliana, my wife, was doing the listings of equipment and Andres was doing beautiful drawings of wildlife, I remember. Having no TV for all the time we were there and visiting in canoe the pygmies along the Ubangi River and so on. And finally, uh, the road is never simple, and uh, I was fortunate to be in Liberia, in this area, which is the only unmapped, uncharted area of the world. This is the, the rainforest of West Africa, which still remains intact, but uh, as you can see, it will not be lasting forever. And uh, at rainy, during the rainy season, believe me, there is no way to pass through there, and we had to spend many nights uh, on the mud, just sitting on the Land Rover, uh, that was trying to cross us through. And uh, the most uh, bizarre occurrences, in the middle of the worst drought, we got water inside a gas tank in the, Sahara, in the Sahel, which is the fringe of the desert. And those things are the kind of problems that may, I will be encountering in my road to the projects I have to either visit or formulate. This one, <coughs> which you see here, it was very interesting because when I got the Fulbright Scholar Award, I had already been selected to go to Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh you know, is a country which floods two-thirds of it uh, every year at rain, during the rainy seasons. And uh, I was uh, requested there to do the evaluation 
of, and I'm going to read literally, then there is no, no ambiguity. The purpose of the mission was to perform a midterm evaluation, including recommendations and or project modifications for the successful completion of a major human settlement pilot project funded by the United Nations with technical assistance for execution supervision by Habitat and field administrative support and coordination by the United Nations Development Program. The first development objective of the project was to assist the government in providing housing and basic community services to the poorest segment of the population of Dhaka. The second development objective was to implement a pilot project to guide the government in the formulation of a strategy and methodology to provide low-cost housing for the poorest population in the country. The immediate objective was the resettlement on a site of 92 acres of approximately 2,600 squatter families settled since 1975 in the Bashantek area. The project comprised a land reclamation component of, five, of 53 acres along the floodplain of the Turak River by embankment construction and earth filling, construction of basic infrastructure, erection of 2,500 core houses with double pit latrines and community facilities, covering health, education, religion, and training centers, income generation projects, and community development activities. And there is the whole thing. Now, it's kind of interesting. This is the map you get in the hotel when you reach Dhaka. This is the map where 1,100 slums are sited in the city of Dhaka. Of course, they do not appear in both maps. And it's also curious that when, where you find the international airport is where usually there are close by uh, squatter settlements. Uh, it's land that usually no one wants to live close by. Uh, the area I was in charge to evaluate is this one, which was a nice, uh, well, nice. It was a new uh, settlement comprising approximately 20,000 people into it. Uh, this is the images I have from that, and literally this was an uh, overimposed uh, image, but that's the sensation. It's a very well spread city, no major features, just uh, the Secretariat of Louis Kahn, and which I'm not going to, to look at it now, but more or less this is the type of life that goes on in the city. It's a tremendously religious city with many, many minarets along it, as you see it there, and then small shops in the old quarters of Dhaka, very dense, as one of the highest populations density uh, in, in uh, being an agricultural country mainly. And this is the, the project. It's a very simple, very basic uh, courthouse, which is this part here with latrines. Now, you will say, well, this is so primitive. What can we do with that? Well, you will somewhat value it better when you start to realize that those people were living without nothing, just clinging to a, a pieces of plastic and cardboard, and this was for them a big step ahead. They were getting the ownership of the land and the design and construction of these facilities was based on the possibilities of payment they had on a 10-year loan period. Uh, it was interesting there too, uh, sometimes you have to overcome while you do your field work uh, unexpected problems, like for example, the, the women of the settlement, there were already more than 500 families settled while work was still going on, started to grab my hands and take me to inside their houses to show me some problems that were existing. And of course, I was not speaking Bengali, therefore I was asking one of the people from the government who was with me to translate. And uh, well, they, want, they didn't want to translate me because there a man usually do not translate from a woman or from a lower caste uh, person. Therefore, finally, I had to do my own interpretation, and I decided to go along, not taking anyone with me, and say, you go, you do the official visit, I do my own visit by my own means. And then finally, with sign language and pointing with fingers and so on, I learned which ones the problems were. But nonetheless, this is a typical courthouse, and, uh, and that's what the world at this point does are called site and service schemes. Now, talking about local resources, uh, what you see here is the embankment uh, construction, and uh, this is also very curious, the, the sand or the laterite which is brought there for the construction of the embankment comes from, not from close by, but from places along the Ganges or the Brahmaputra River, which people dive with baskets to collect the sand from the bottom of the river, load it into the boat, take the boat, bring the boat to the embankment, and then build the embankment. Here you see the process of the work. 
it's interesting also to know that those little bamboo sticks that are there on the ground are put because if not the cows which cannot be disturbed but will go and eat the, the grass that will grow to reinforce the embankments. Utilization of bamboo but also of some more sophisticated construction techniques to reinforce the embankment. Uh, again, very, very traditional ways and using what is called labor-intensive construction, which is the resource they have. In Bangladesh, it's like the border with Mexico. There are many, many maquiladoras-like factories in which people are enclosed for the day and they're paid less than one dollar uh, per person women's half of that, and uh, they will produce many of the shirts and jeans and things that we wear here. Uh, nonetheless, women are fundamental for the development of the community, and in this you see that they are doing what is called uh, uh, community participation in the construction. And then finally, another amazing thing, I had to evaluate the construction of 2,500 double pit latrines, I think is the biggest ever constructed number of latrines in the world and uh, but that's the way technology goes you see there are no ways to put sewages in a land that is inundated and so I mean tremendous difficult problems to solve but nonetheless some uh, uh, volunteer organizations like CARE from, from uh, Scotland were involved in this project and did a tremendous job this place had very little mortality infants and adults mortality and then finally you start to see consolidation of the settlements by little gardens, little shops, spontaneous economical developments which were emerging there. Interesting to notice too, which Bangladesh is a land with no stones, it's all uh, fluvial, uh, flooded land, and therefore bricks have to be cooked. Here you see them piled, made with clay, and then broken down into pieces to be used as aggregate for construction of the pillars. And the ones to do that are women, and then they have to protect their hands with pieces of tire from cars to not damage their, their fingers. And they are paid, I don't know if you are seeing them, putting little uh, seeds, each five bricks that they have to, to break. Now, Okay, from there I was teaching at the University of Nairobi and then I was called by Habitat, which happens to be in Nairobi and Habitat was the one who was doing the supervision of the work I evaluated in Bangladesh and then they called me to go to a place which I never dreamed in my life to be doing anything or even going there. And this is the People's Republic of Laos. Uh, you all will remember, of course, that there is where the last battle of Vietnam was fought in the plain of Jars, although never war was declared. And I was there at the same time as the first team of uh, U.S. Uh, people were digging for remains of people who died in, the, in those battles. It was, it was kind of a, of a very, very emotional uh, moment. And uh, it's, a, it's a country which, of course, stopped development since the time of the war and stayed like that. Uh, nothing really could happen in the, in the communist regime. And now they are, they are desperate for opening and that I was one of the first contingent of consultants to go there, mainly to propose plans for urban strengthening. Uh, they have a very, very fast growth in their urban centers, although the capital is uh, just big as 150,000 inhabitants. That's the capital of Yantian. And then I went to the second city, Savannakhet, and both are along the Mekong River, which has 50,000 inhabitants. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful country. I was really open heart and open arms received. And uh, I spent a month working alone in the country with the technicians, with people who had been in re-education camps which were very kind, very soft people, unable to say no to anything. They were so much brainwashed that the, the word no was almost eradicated from their vocabulary. And, uh, but they were brought back because they were the ones who were trained by the West, by the French people, and the ones who could deal with consultants from the West. There is where I saw the power of a network like CNN, who was being seen from Bangkok, and how it had helped to change the political regimes in those countries. And those are the beautiful vats and stupas or the sofas which are on top of their, of their temples which have been kept and were in process of renovation to try to attract some of the tourism in this area from the west. And as a matter of fact, I was flying in a Lao airplane built by Russian industry 
to with a German scholar who was going to do the first tourist book after the, the communist regime in the country. Phenomenal woodwork. Uh, this is a temple which is called the Sikhsaket Temple. It was more than 6,000 little silver Buddhas encrusted in the walls and then all kinds of Buddhas around. It's a very, very religious country. It's interesting that, again, the communist regime couldn't really uh, downplay the influence of the religious people which take care of education and social matters in the country. They were very gentle, they really received me open uh, with their heart. And here you see a typical French colonial building. Just to notice, this is not a stone arch, it's a wooden arch. To my, sur my surprise, you will see it more clearly there. And that's more or less what the city looked like uh, since the time of the colony. And uh, this is downtown Vientiane, and it's one of the most extraordinary cities because it's still a rural setting. You go on the back of the houses, and there are still rice fields abandoned. Uh, of course, you imagine the amount of mosquitoes that breed in there, and therefore the city is in need of a lot of support. Uh, not, well, I went too far. They are still fishing inside the, the rice fields for frogs and little fish, which are sold alive. And, uh, what you see in here is the typical construction of the typical contemporary house where some substitution and improvement has been gone with the prefabrication of the pillars. Social life goes there underneath it in the city and then the private life goes on the top. It's very, uh, I will say, appropriate design where it covers you from the rain, it allows you for fresh breezes, kids are sometimes hanging hammocks underneath it. It's just uh, good sense in terms of design. And uh, I was amazed, uh, like three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I learned from the news that uh, in the West Coast, in the US, we are looking at this technology. This is a technology this, which is uh, uh, developed since some time, I will say, in the third world by people from the Uni University of Louvain, Catholic University of Louvain. They are, they are very, very instrumental in helping the developing world. And uh, this is mechanical bricks which do not, do not use mortar for their assembly. They just uh, connect together and are making rigid uh, partitions and exterior walls. Of course, for me, this culturally is not really the appropriate design. I will look forward in those countries. It's uh, too much like a Western design. But nonetheless, it's commendable that the technology of the third world sometimes is reaching the first world and benefiting everyone. Of course, those bricks are made with compacted earth. OK, then after Laos, I had, again, my romance with Africa, I think, will be perpetual. But nonetheless, I had the experience of visiting 40 villages in the land of Kunta Kinte and uh, Jufure. The town is uh, somewhere along this, I think, there. Gambia, it's a very, very interesting country, which goes along the Gambia River, west coast of Africa, surrounded by Senegal. Senegal speaks French, Gambia speaks English. That tells you about the colonial times. There was a division artificial of the land, and it stays like that now. What you see circled in different colors with different notations, this is my road map. And uh, I had to, of course, meet in this example. I show it to you mainly to, to tell about the people which I consider the clients, my clients. My clients, when, when the United Nations ask me to go somewhere, is not the United Nations. As a matter of fact, the United Nations are more the people who are going to evaluate what they do as much as their technicians or the, 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 what is called the uh, CTAs, chief technical advisors. And my, my clients, the real ones, are the beneficiaries. And the beneficiaries are the people of the communities I go to. And here you see, and this is for the record too, the place where Kunta Quinte must have been kept while waiting to be shipped to America. Uh, it's in the middle of the Gambia River in a small island uh, away from the coast. And this is the coast of the Gambia River and the ocean is right there. Uh, this house is a house built, it is believed, 600 years ago and it's called the house of the Mambamba, which is one of the leaders, the spiritual leaders of the Gambia. And uh, one of them must have known the family of Kunta Quinta, it is believed, and the actual one is right there. Uh, 
in the Gambia also, something very curious happened to me is the first time I, I, I usually talk with the people, meet the people, sit with them, eat with them, got malaria, was uh, with, with, with uh, stomach disease and so on. And, uh, but this is the first time that women came to me, and this, this happened in, in uh, May of last year. They came to me in the village, and uh, they were for the first time not afraid to speak with me about venereal diseases and AIDS. And uh, believe me, when you know the, the, the people in Africa, they will not speak to you openly unless it is an emergency. And I will say that at this point, this is an emergency. And we need to be aware of that. It is spreading in the communities. Some of their cultural patterns, of course, favor that. But at this point, I see that the, the problem is so acute. And I was in Bangui at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic and uh, listening to the people of the Pasteur Institute sending the telegrams with the first statistics ever collected. But at this point, it starts really to frighten me too, because when the women of an African village comes to you, which are a man from the West asking for help, please do something, is because really the, the problem is, 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 is bad. And uh, this project was very interesting. I was evaluating there one of the biggest and first construction of primary health care facilities, 185 of them, along the country, based on the Alma Ata resolution of the World Health Organization for preventive care. And uh, I was also in charge of evaluating a project which uh, Bob Kester, which I'm, is not here, but we may tell him another time, these will be happier for uh, energy utilization through photovoltaic solar panels, which were developed by NASA. And I think that's one of the great contributions of technology in the third world. Sometimes it's the one that we do not suspect. Aerospace technology, and the United States was the first to develop photovoltaic panels. This technology today is mastered in Africa. And it's well known and is bringing benefits to all populations. Close by this city in Richmond, Indiana, was one of the best ever designed and built solar refrigerators for vaccinations. And it was tested on the field in Africa, mainly in Gambia, at the beginning of the history of solar energy. And uh, this is the result. The decrease of infant mortality in, West, in, in the Gambia came from 250 per thousand to 165 per thousand in three, four years. That's a phenomenal improvement. And uh, I was in charge of evaluating that and to evaluate also the solar energy uh, implementation into the telecommunications along the country. Those are my clients. The Community Development Committee of every village, composed by the elders of the village. Here you have a uh, midwife, which was the ones who really relate to the population, the one I had to talk with to know about the impact of the project. And then my colleagues, this man is a technician from Gamtel, the telecommunications agency in the country, and that woman is the immunization expert, regional uh, head for the area we were looking for. But you see, the places we go is not necessarily the easiest ones. Those are the ones where tourists are not necessarily being there. One of the facilities, you cannot make them simpler. Uh, the idea is not to construct great architecture, the idea is to help the community. And it did work. At one point, they identified the building, not by the name of the building, but, but the name, we were asking primary health care, and they were pointing the buildings. Here, the interior, and those are the ways the meetings goes, the chief of the village, the nurse, uh, all the people interested in the discussion were there to instruct us about the problems. Typical floor plan looks very much like the ones I did in 1984 without knowing this project. We didn't know each other, the one who formulated this project, and myself, the design was pretty much the same. Although this one had serious problems, like things that you will never imagine could occur. First, a little leak, then a panel goes down, finally, bat infestation turns the building inhabitable. Those things really are very, very difficult to, to predict, almost impossible. Here you see where the bats get inside the building. This is what should be done, what, this is what should be done. This is the whole difference. This is not necessarily nicer, it's better. And then finally, a typical installation of solar energy, charged cells, and then the panels, which a lot of defects, difficulties in the fields, Amazing places where things were installed. 
overcoming the worst problems. A big battery of solar arrays, you see solar, solar energy is alive and well in Africa and I think that they are going really to get in the face of commercialization of solar energy. That's what things are, ha are, are happening. They're not experimenting, they're using it at this point. And then finally, uh, this one is very dear to me because as I showed at the beginning, I was trained in Latin America, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, and then finally I went back in Bolivia and I was called in here, close to Lake Titicaca, to go to La Paz and uh, visit also one of the most uh, significant phenomenon of uh, development in third world countries, which is rapid urbanization. And uh, we are in one of the highest cities or in countries of the world. Approximately La Paz is at 3,800 meters. And the city I had to evaluate the project was at above 4,000, close to 4,200 or 300. That is, I believe, close to 15,000 feet uh, above sea level. Believe me, you cannot breathe there. I mean, it's very, very difficult to do anything. Nonetheless, people live and prosper or not. And uh, typical La Paz, the, the imprint of the colonial times where Spanish architecture is still present and the typical aljibe or, or water fountain, water well, the patio and the local people and so on. Wonderful city, nice city. Local technologies, bamboo used for moldings in European style, uh, but with local resources, typical Spanish ironwork. Wonderful craftsmanship. Modern La Paz, it's a mixture of past and present. It's a vibrant city. It's a very interesting city. You have the, the big shot of Harvard in economy, who is redressing some of the big structural economical problems of the country. It's apparently being effective, and there is a lot, a lot now, now of young people, well-trained, who are running matters there and policies. The people I had to deal with are these ones, the young people of the city of El Alto, and uh, the Aymara Indians, which were pushed with the new economical plan from the mining industry of the Altiplano to the cities. And there is a lot of in-between cities migration, not only from, there's always a mistake that we believe that people migrate from rural to urban. It happens many times from rural to rural, just looking for luck in another city. This is La Paz. It's a megalopolis at this point. It looks like a, like a kettle. This is the rim. You cannot go higher. There is a limit. You cannot build above that level because it's a peak of the mountain, high winds, high temperatures, no feasible land for construction. But these French, the one that is with a little like a mosaic type of thing, this is where the poor people live. The ones I had to look for were living there, where no one wanted to be. It's interesting, La Paz is kind of a section where the poorest are at the top and the richest at the bottom. The, 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 the top is for the windy, very primitive conditions, I will say, and then the bottom there on the, the valleys where the warm weather and so on is, and you see construction with local materials, in between construction, high rise in downtown. Downtown is just one street that runs along this valley. It's mainly a valley. Uh, again, the city I had to deal with is this one. It's the fastest growing city in the world, close to 10% annual growth. It's growing so fast that La Paz doesn't want to do anything with it anymore. It has been named as an independent city, therefore cut of any resources, monetary resources from La Paz. And it's kind of curious because the people who live here work downtown in La Paz, big movement of people. They work as servants, they work in, in, in uh, construction works, as, as uh, uh, sweepers, uh, newspaper vendors, etc. You see a lot of unfinished buildings in, in Bolivia, that's a reflection of uh, economic inflation, hyperinflation. People were putting things on bricks because money was losing value rapidly. The pattern of growth, this is the origin of La Paz. Finally, the city I had to deal with is this part here, and La Paz is there. You see La Paz was working concentrically along the river, and then here, interesting, remember Bangladesh, in Dhaka, Mirpur, the settlement I was talking about, same pattern. Around the airport, 
the airport is so high that international airlines will not go there. Jumbo jets cannot land. The air is too thin. And therefore, the only ones are small Boeing planes. But people leave, and you have 400,000 inhabitants in this city. Now, the big, this is the projection for the future. The big problem, 60% has no sewage, no bathroom facilities. 40% of them have no running water. This is the big problem now. And believe me, we want to put it away. I'm going, I think I don't need translation. This is not guerrilla, this is the war against cholera. If that happened, Weiner was there. The big problem, I don't know if you heard, it happens. It happened when I was in Bangladesh. There was a plane from Saudi Arabia Airlines, one of the best in the world, the most sophisticated ones, had to do an emergency landing in India, in Bombay, because there was food contamination. The same happened to an Argentinian airplane not some t long time ago. The plane had done a stopover in La Paz. La Paz was from where the contamination of cholera came. What happened? The people in the plane got sick because the food was loaded in the plane in La Paz, got them sick. Some of them died, arriving to the United States. We can't ignore that. In Europe, they know it also. Around the major airports in Europe, there is malaria. By the way, I got malaria in Dhaka, in an international hotel. It was a five-star hotel. Nonetheless, I got malaria. People around the airports get malaria. Why? Because mosquito travels in plane. Therefore, difficult problems to ignore. We can develop ourselves, but if we don't take care of these problems, the network makes it to be close to us. And that's the city, you see. It's, uh, construction goes on, but little more than that. Little assistance from the community. Very difficult political times. Beautiful scenery. I mean, unbelievable scenery. It gets loser and loser as it goes to the edges, still people build in different levels. It's kind of interesting. The first level is made out of adobe, earth bricks. And then the upper levels, because they need lighter materials, are made out of bricks. And then there is where the savings goes. It is not yet inhabited. The, the, the lower part is inhabited. But it's a savings for the future in uncertain times. And then finally, the typical little church and uh, people seeking better fortune going to taken to the roads, and then the late Titicaca. Uh, there, too, I had to formulate a project, mainly to recommend them, something that is not very easily understood in urban planning, but that is that community participation and community development is part of the urban planner's problem. And uh, that was one of my roles in that place. Sorry. OK, now I'm sorry to have been a little bit long. If I can go back. Yeah. OK. And then here we are. This is what I did uh, on top of the Fulbright while I was teaching at the University of Nairobi. And uh, all these projects were around that year spent in Nairobi. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Mm. Africa, you see, has been, has been the, the, the continent where Europeans were going around while exploring Earth. And uh, it's kind of interesting because all the travels, the exploration travels, at one point were stopping in Malindi or were stopping in Manda or Lamu Islands. And uh, there is where, where, where we, I did this work, is where those people, those Daos, they're they are, they are still getting to their island in Dao. There's no other way. Not even in plane. You, you take a plane, but you land in another island. And then from there, you take a Dao and you get into a city-state in the island of Lamu, in the archipelago of Lamu, in the Indian Ocean, which are on, on top, in reality, of a coral reef formation along the coast, the east coast of Africa. In here is where Vasco de Gama met one of the best sailors of Africa, which showed him the way to the east. And then finally, he found India and, and Goa. And uh, it's a place who presents the only and better preserved urban settlement ever produced in Africa by Swahili culture, which is a culture which, like a sponge, takes everything from, from the Arabia, from India, from uh, black Africa, from the fringe of the desert. And then I had heard that there were some extraordinary coral houses being built there. The city, of course, is regulated by the tides of the Indian Ocean, which are the real clock, the internal clock that everyone and the external one watches to measure time in that place. And all the life, in reality, is generated 
through the relationship with the ocean and the mangrove islands that uh, are covered in, in between Rian, between salty and fresh waters, and uh, the construction materials come from the islands. This is coral stone made blocks. Those are boriti, which comes from the mangler. This is our coral rags that are used for construction. And uh, of course, food and supplies come from the water there too. The island is a solid network of small streets which do not allow for cars. There are no cars in the island. The only car is from the district officer. And it just, it just can go in one road, the one that is along the water. And transportation for construction even goes in donkey. They have one of the only hospitals for dunking on, on, on the world, in the world. And uh, this is the, their companion to carry heavy loads. The, the streets follows a pattern which use monsoon winds to cool the houses. And women are very much restricted to meet and to exchange words with foreigners. They are very religious, very strong Islamic believers. And, uh, and that's the way they have designed their houses. They are, they are based on very strong private, privacy gradients. But one of the features those houses have is the entrance, which is called the Dhaka. And uh, it's like an open vestibule to the street. It's where people meet other people, where life goes on at evening time when the sun has set and people relax. And then the street gets lively with little candles and, 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 and gas lamps or kerosene lamps. And then those seats are called the Barasas is where people sit and chat, as you see there. As you enter, either you go up and, and, and into a patio, there are elevated patios, or you go to a central patio, and every, every measure of this house is, is made out of boriti. This is the length of a straight boriti pole, and you see the steepness of the stair somewhat is conditioned because the length of the bariti do not exceed more than three meters. Therefore, that's the length of the, of, of the construction model. The same happened with the rooms of the house. The, room, the house is designed and built through elongated models of no more than three meters deep by close to seven meters long. And uh, they have, as you go inside the house, had some problem with focus. Is there any possibility of focusing better those slides? Uh, this is a wall which is called the Zidaka at the end of the sequence of room in the house and it's for them to exhibit their wealth. And their wealth was, as we saw, the route coming from the east with goods from China and those are China dishes which were exhibited. And wife in, of the harem, this was a polygamous society, were exhibiting their wealth there, chanting, having the Kiswahili poetry was one of the most famous in the East Africa region, and very fine carving with coral plaster. Of course, there's a process of pro pro producing it and so on, was embellishing the house. Those uh, niches were somehow proportionally deformed in their perspective to counterbalance the shortness of the perspective. And uh, now the, the, this one needs focus, please. If could be. Thank you. Uh, this is a section through one of those houses. The houses are very much internally oriented towards the patio. But one of the real things that struck my, my, my interest is this, the bathroom. And you will see this guy is always obsessed. He already looked at 2,500 pit latrines and now he's telling us about bathrooms. Well, well, that's one of the things I found which was kind of unique in this house or those houses. And uh, those people had long time ago before even Europeans were having sophisticated bathrooms. We're talking here about cities that were constructed, it is believed, around the 900th century. And uh, I mean, 900 BC, I'm sorry, a 10th century uh, after death. And uh, they were having bathrooms with water available inside their homes in the upper levels of their houses, like in this case in this section. And they had internal pit latrines. And that's a totally unnormal way, non-traditional way of placing a latrine. I was told when I was learning about architecture and development for the third world and so on, that latrines should be very far away, like Europe was doing, at the end of the back yard or somewhere in a garden. Well, 
every project that has been done in the world in that way was never very successful in teaching hygiene. In this case, both the project in Bangladesh, which was having the latrines very close to the dwelling, or these houses, which are still used in this way, some of them have a very, very clean latrine or sanitary system. They had a reserve of water inside this water tank, which is called a birita, and water was poured from a conduit with a funnel outside the bathroom. Sometimes this conduit was connecting two houses of two neighbors. If one neighbor had no well, it had a funnel from the house of his neighbor, and his neighbor was pouring water for his bathroom to be filled up with fresh water. The water was used from the birika for personal hygiene and for cleansing in the latrine. The latrine, and that's one of the most amazing things, is the most ornated area of the house. It looks very much like a qibla. For those who know a little bit about Islamic architecture, the qibla was a niche which usually is oriented towards La Mecca for prayer in the mosques. Well, these niches had trifoliate arches and had hapsides or half domes shaped roof with fine ornaments. And that's extremely bizarre in, in, a, in, a, in a culture like this one in which the most ornated part of the house is the latrine room. Now, more curious even is what you see here, which is a china bowl which was set at the, end, at the bottom of the birika or the water cistern because in the, water, in the water of the cistern were little fish. And those little fish were there and I believe that that's the first ever on Earth, and we're talking here again, uh, from the 10th century up to the late, the, the ones who are best preserved up from the 17th century. There are ruins which are going to see from the 13th and 14th century using the system. The little fish were eating larvae of the mosquito, which usually grow in stagnant water, therefore controlling spread of malaria. The dish sunken at the bottom was there to keep some water when cleaning the birika or when big drought was there in the region and the pits were emptied through a conduit uh, and uh, when it was filled then from the street there was another pit dug and then from the bottom they were emptying the sludge remaining and filling the hole down at the bottom there and this was done once every 40 years something like that therefore those people sustain urban growth with not modern technologies for sanitation and having a very high density urban environment with uh, harmonious control of their diseases vectors through the utilization of live creatures and this is the way the carving of the color plaster was going on they had the coconut as a measure for using little water water is scarce there there is no connection or supply known in the island but the one that is found, and this is very curious too, underneath dunes, and therefore when it rains, the sweet water floats on top of the salty water, and that, that thin layer is the one that provides water to the community. And there were wells along the streets, which were providing the community. Some of the wells were inside the houses, and in some of the houses, the water was collected from the roofs. And uh, of course, that equilibrium is difficult to keep in many of those towns had disappeared uh, and what remains are ruins and it is believed mainly because they were running out of water because of overconsumption of it. Here you see those funnel-like structures which were used to either bring water from one neighbor to the other or fill it from the courtyard to the, the bathroom. A fine example of a latrine, the carvings, very geometric the vaulted roof and the trifoliate arch. From inside, looking to the birika, and then floor plans. This is the latrine with the squatting plate. There is a very, very interesting, intricate set of sloped steps that will bring water from here through this conduit to the latrine, the funnel to bring the water inside the birika, the one we saw before, the funnel to bring the water to the neighbor, the latrine, very, very sophisticated with those little windows to bring some minimal light and uh, the dish sunken at the bottom. Some details of the fine carving of, this is called a data wall. This is a screen which usually divides for privacy 
the berica, which will be here from the latrine and here the front of the arch of the latrine. This is another one of the most ornated ones that I found, which you are looking here at the ceiling, very elaborate carving and the trifolate arch. This is the where I'm going there to one town where where ruins from the 14th and 13th century were found, and here you see how they process the coral rag to produce lime and therefore using it in construction. Those are the mangrove or man, manglar channels. The ruins, a mosque. You see what I was talking to you, this is what is known in Islamic architecture to be used to point to Mecca for prayer, and it's exactly the same pattern that they are using for the latrines in that town. And uh, in there I found, in the front of this mosque, an ablution tank, which is for cleaning, ritual cleaning, religious cleaning of uh, parts of the body before prayer. And in the 14th century, they already included the china dishes. One here is still visible for keeping the little fish alive whenever cleaning or running short in water. And then here you see an oldest version of a latrine with two holes to hold clay jars with water. That is not anymore a, a, a cistern, but clay jars were held there. And this is a channel because ablutions, cleanup of body was going on there. And what you see continuously here is one remaining conduit, I believe, to bring water from the neighbor. And then the comparison between the oldest version of the bathroom with the holes for the clay jars, the latrine chamber, and then the 17th, 14th century virica with the latrine chamber there, and a window. And you're going to see this window, which for me was kind of an interesting finding too, this is the exterior of the latrine chamber with the pit conduit going down. It is in a patio inside a house. Usually all the bathrooms were always peripheral to the exterior walls. Therefore, the pit could be dug and emptied. But at the same time, you see this very, very small opening that was bringing minimal light, but very bright, on a very obscure chamber and not allowing the eyes to see whoever was there inside. But then, Interestingly enough, this is out of focus too, please, if this could be adjusted a little bit. This provides this kind of bright funnel inside the latrine. And uh, remember, the two worst diseases, vector carrying diseases in, in, in the tropics, one is the mosquito that spreads malaria. The other is flies, who spread any gastrointestinal disease, one of the real worst uh, plagues of the third world. And I believe that this was a naturally designed flight trap to attract the flies, which are light-seeking insects, outside the latrine, and therefore taking them out of entering the pit of the latrine where contamination could occur. This bathroom chamber has three of those, some one have one, some have two. There is no fixed pattern. Now, the problem, you see, this is what we are doing there. This is Western tourism in the island of Lamu, including a Western comfort item. There are big problems with this. Of course, it's a lot more comfortable. I agree with that. Big problem. We need a lot of water. Second problem, a lot of water is released from it. There are no sewage. There is not a reliable source of water, but the rains, which are not predictable. That's now we are contaminating the whole thing, and this is happening rapidly. Uh, the ones I showed you before are the few remaining. Without this dependent kind of technology, which, again, who can imagine the consequences? It, it looks like a benign feature. It is not, depending upon the context. It could be used in the third world, but not always. It's necessary to know exactly when and how. And uh, by the way, aesthetically, it's kind of unpleasant to see these two things put together. And uh, this will be the conclusion of this uh, somewhat longer than expected chat. But you see, this happened in Liberia. I was there too uh, before the war. 
it was was kind of a scary time still. But uh, and this is a slum going on in the beach, and the, this this was a glamorous beach at the time of the colony, and uh, Monrovia, which was the capital. You know that Liberia was a country created. I'm sorry, colony. There was never a colony. It was it was created for freed slaves from the United States, Afro-American people back to. Africa. It was the shortest route from the east coast of Africa to the west coast of, I'm sorry, the east coast of America to the west coast of Africa and named for the name of the President Monroe. And uh, those people didn't have slums at that time or squatter settlements. Like they didn't have the water closet fixture. Like they didn't have the car tires. This is the drawing of a Maasai. Uh, dwelling, and this is the drawing of a squatter settlement in Nairobi, and this is the drawing of a latrine from Lamu. And the problem, we brought it with us. We are the ones who generated peace in one way or the other. I think it's totally unavoidable. We cannot avoid it. But then we have to think and do something about it. At least that's my position. And believe me, it's not easy task. What you see there are bathrooms contaminating the beaches. Right, I'm taking this shot from the hotel I'm staying, downtown Monrovia. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate your patient listening. Thank you. If there are any questions, I will be very happy to answer that. Thank you very much.